Well, friends, again, good morning and welcome to all of you who are here and all of you watching online. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, music team, for leading us into this message. That last verse, the acapella, and that just, that celebrating the grace of God as the people of God. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to do here today. Well, later today, and actually I think it's maybe still going on right now, but we'll see it later today, is the closing ceremony of the Olympics. I mean, how fun has the last two weeks been, huh, with the Olympics? Do you see the opening ceremony? You know, thousands of athletes, right? They come out uh, marching, walking behind their, their, the banner of their country's flag. It's, it's impressive, isn't it? Thousands of athletes. So many, so many hopes, so many, so many expectations, so many dreams in that opening ceremony. I think it's, it's fascinating, too, to just see the, the diversity of peoples, Right? Uh, I no event on the planet calls attention to that as much as the Olympics do, right? The differences of, of cultures, the way, the way people dress, right? The different colors of, of skin, of hair, of eyes, right? The different ways people speak, the, the different languages that they speak. And among the athletes in general, uh, so many different shapes and sizes, like how fun is it to like see a, a seven foot men's basketball player holding a flag alongside of like the five foot female gymnast? Right? That's pretty cool. And yet, despite all those differences that we see in those moments, there, there, there are those little, little moments throughout the Olympics, right, where, where you realize kind of just how much we all actually have in common, too, don't you? Like, we're, we're all human. After all, many, uh, many of the storylines in the Olympics that you hear, they, they demonstrate our, our common humanity, our desire for friendship even. Did you hear about the, the gold medal for the, the men's high jump? Right, hear about these two guys? Uh, friends, actually, from two different countries, Qatar and Italy, the athletes competing in the high jump. They both won. <laughs> How cool is that? I mean, they both, uh, they tied. And, and they, all the tiebreakers worked out. They tied. They got to share. Well, they each got their own, but they shared first place. They got, each of them, their own gold medal. And they were happy about it. Right? It's just one of those wonderful, you know, memorable moments. Well, yet as, as much as NBC and the Olympic storytellers, though, would like us all to feel in our core that we're all united all of us around the world, every 8 billion plus person on this planet, we know, we know that's not really true either, though. There are many conflicts raging still in our world, many controversies, many hostilities, prejudices, hatreds, right? There are different political ideologies, deeply held different beliefs, there, there really is no true unity among the visible nations beneath the, the flags that we wave. And we'd be foolish to pretend otherwise. And, and because we live in a, in, a, in a world that's been fractured by sin, broken apart by sin, even sadly the, the same thing is true when it comes to what we might call visible earthly Christian churches. Right? And, and I'm not talking now about the different buildings that are out there, the different styles of architecture that are out there. Not church as a building, but like I talked about with the kids, I'm talking about the groups of people. Right? Different groups, different denominations, different synods and so forth. Right? There are different teachings, different traditions, different beliefs and practices. There are some deep, deep rifts and controversies. Ah. And some of these are important because they have to do with teachings in the Bible, the truths of God's word that we, that we don't want to lose, that we can't compromise. But, but some of these things, they're, they're not all that important. They're just one person's personal preference about a style or a, a program or about their opinion of the pastor or whatever and so forth, right? But let's be honest, and maybe this is where some of you are coming from or you, you're just thinking about your, your past perhaps in the church and there's some hurt feelings there. Maybe even sometimes it's all kind of enough to just 
almost make a person want to just give up on the church altogether, right? But friends, hang with me here today, because today what we're going to see in our text from the Bible is really a, a bigger vision of the church, the church, capital C, from God's perspective. Something that we don't always maybe think about that much, and in which we can't clearly see because of sin, our minds and hearts are clouded, right? However, what we're going to see today in the book of Revelation chapter 7 is, is something that's going to help us to think about what it is that we're actually saying when we, when we confess in the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the Holy Christian Church. We don't always see it or feel it, but we believe it. We believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Uh, did you know that those two phrases are descriptive of one another? The communion of saints describes the Holy Christian Church. And, and that's why later on when we confess in the creed, what I, what I tend to do, I, I kind of like just go right into it. Like, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints! And I hope to see why that is and is such wonderful good news today. So here's what I want to do. I want to help you today, okay, to see the beauty of of the invisible church, the church with a capital C, right? To see with eyes of faith the beauty of the invisible church, the church with the capital C church, okay? So here is our Bible reading, and we'll kind of break it up into some pieces here. The first verse from Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 is where we'll start today. The Apostle John says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Okay, so what, what's going on here? Well, here in Revelation chapter 7, John sees a vision of, of heaven, right? And so there's this symbolic imagery that we see. He sees what we might call the church triumphant, right? The church triumphant. He sees the, the victorious holy Christian church. Okay, that, that's the meaning of the symbolism behind the palm branches, Right? Palm branches were ancient symbols of victory. Okay? But that's not all. He sees it's, it's, a, it's a pure, holy church. And that's the symbolism behind everyone wearing white, white robes. Okay? Like, there's no, there are no distinctions here. There's no, no distinctions of wealth. Nobody's flaunting it. Nobody's strutting it. There's, there's nobody's making somebody else feel like they're nobody. Or wishing that they were somebody, right? There are no distinctions of wealth or power. There's, there's no division or hostility, hatred, no guilt, no shame. Together here, they're all clothed the same. They are all together holy. What a, what a beautiful picture of unity, huh? Unity, finally. And yet... This is cool. And yet there are still, there's still this incredible description of diversity, isn't there? Amazing unity, but there's this description of and celebration even of diversity. Right? In, in John's visit, what, what does he see? Again, it says he sees people from, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, right? right? See, so, so you, you know what's cool with this? Cool about this? Right? Check this out. What, what, what is, what's different here on earth is celebrated there in heaven. Right? What, what, is di what makes us different here is celebrated there. Now, I'm talking about how God, in his wisdom, his creative wisdom and power, made us uniquely different, didn't he? And put us into different families from among many different cultures. How cool is that? 
not a boring God. He celebrates creativity and his own diversity. And, and you know, how, how amazing that the salvation accomplished by Jesus is that which sets uh, the hearts free no matter who you are, no matter where you've grown up or how you've lived. His good news sets people free from all over. And really, what does it do? It redeems and it restores and it reconciles right? from every culture a new community, a new kind of humanity, one that together finally sings with one voice. And here's the next verse, chat, uh, verse 10. And they cried out in a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders. That represents the church. And the four living creatures. That represents all creation. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever Amen. I'm not done with my sermon, by the way. <laughs> then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. <laughs> and he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Do you, do you see the beauty of the invisible church? I think this is a beautiful text here to help us understand what it really means to say that someone is as a member of the, the holy Christian church. Who, who is a member of the holy Christian church? Well, simply put, Christians are Right? So what, what do I mean by that? I mean simply Christians are people who have trusted in and will trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, the one who rescues them from sin and death. That's it. Period and exclamation point. Right? That, that's what it means. Right? Christians are all those who by faith have, to use the imagery here, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ took away the sins of the world when he, when he was crucified, died, and was buried. Right? So that's, that's what we're talking about here. Those who belong to the church, capital C, the Holy Christian Church, are those, all those who've been clothed with Christ's righteousness so that they are now qualified to stand pure and holy in the very presence of God for all eternity. Right? And, and here in John's vision, these are, these are those from, from, from all human history, from every, every corner of the planet, from many different countries who ever lived and died believing in Jesus. Right? That's what it means to be a Christian, to be a member of the holy Christian church through faith alone in Christ. Right? So I'm not talking about whether a person attended a, a Roman Catholic church or a Lutheran church or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or a Methodist church or a non-denominational church or an Eastern Orthodox church or a Coptic church. I'm talking about do you believe with a humble and repentant heart that Jesus Christ is the one sent by God who rescued you truly and completely from sin and death? Right? Amen? Because if so, you are a member of the Holy Christian Church. Remember, little, medium, big, from wherever you come from. How cool is that? All right? But listen to me. Where do Christians come from? Now, I know that's kind of like a weird question, right? But that's the question that John actually gets asked. Right? Did you catch that? He's looking at this amazing vision of heaven and all this beauty and all this mind-blowing stuff, and, he's, and he gets asked the question, hey, who are they? And then, where do they come from? Right, a voice from heaven asks John, right, says, he says, these in white robes. I, kinda, I think I was like, snap out of it, John. These in white robes. Who are they? 
And where did they come from? And John's like, well, sir, you know. He's like, well, you tell me. (laughs) And then what does he hear in reply? This is what he hears. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. Now, friends, I want to point out something here. In in the Greek text of the New Testament here, the phrase translated, they have come out, like past tense. That's how it's translated here in the NIV. In the Greek, it's actually the present tense. And if you, if you look at a bunch of other English translations, you'll see that reflected in probably the majority of them. And they, they'll say, these are they who are coming out. These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation, right? Like, like one by one, these are the ones coming out when they're called to faith and die in faith and are ushered into glory. So, okay, what's my point, right? Well, the apostle John right, is the one, who's, he's, he's seeing this vision and he's being inspired to record this for us, but he, he himself was in the middle of what we could call the great tribulation, right? as the last living apostle of Jesus Christ, the only one not martyred or killed for his testimony about Jesus, he's, he's suffering persecution. He's in isolation. He's exiled on the island of Patmos. Right? He's experiencing social and physical distancing, isolation from the people that he loves and cares about the most. And one day soon, he knows he's going to die right? for his faith in Jesus. And when he, when he dies, what does John know? He's going he's gonna to be one of those who are coming out of the great tribulation into glory. Now, of course, we, we are living in what feel like such different times in many ways, Right? And really, like, we've been so blessed to enjoy a long season of prosperity and, and freedom as the Christian church, especially here in the United States. Like, it's been relatively easy for a long time to be a Christian. But friends, don't, don't let the devil fool you. The fact is that you and I are also in the middle of the great tribulation in our day, too. And though it may not come up on your social media news feed, because remember, you only see what they want you to see and what the algorithms pump into your your brain. But all around the world, there are Christians, your brothers and sisters in Christ, who are experiencing persecution and loss for the name of Jesus. Risking their lives to gather for worship. Giving up their businesses and their incomes and their their potential uh, you know, ability to have access to gainful employment and such to remain faithful to the testimony of Jesus. They are in the middle of the great tribulation. And yes, according to the Bible, this great tribulation that we're in, we may be entering in this, this little short season where things intensify right before Jesus comes back. That, that may very well be, but make no mistake, we are in tribulation now. We are in the end times, the time between Christ's ascension into heaven, right? And there was John, the apostles there in that. We're in this too until Jesus comes back on the last day. We are in the middle of the great tribulation. And so this is a time when our faith in Jesus is going to be tested. This is a time when it's going to be increasingly a challenge to hang on to the truth of God's word and to go out and to share it in the face of opposition before it's too late. Okay, the book of Acts talks about this and, and it says, reading from the New King James Version, because they nail it with the translation here, it says, we must, must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations. Friends, I just, I hope and I pray that this today gives you a sense of why we need each other. Okay, to encourage and support and and to pray for one another, especially 
especially in a world where, where people are trying to fracture the church, when people are trying to isolate believers one from another to fragment us as if we can hang on all by ourselves. Because history has shown us not how it works. God designed the church to be a gathering group of family to encourage and to support and to pray for and to be there for each other. I pray that you get a sense of why it's important that if you believe in Jesus, you're a member of the Holy Christian Church, but then God also wants you to, to, to love and to serve as a member of a local church. Right? And to be together as the people of God in a place where the, the word of God is preached and taught and what you believe is its truth and purity so that you can, you can share that. And so if by faith, friends, today you can see even, even a glimpse of the beauty of this invisible church, this capital C church that you would also love and want to serve in your local church right here of which you're a part. And you know, I, I, mean, I know this means dealing sometimes with some flawed people, some frustrating people, some selfish people, people like pastors, right, like me. But can I just, as we kind of close up, can I just share with you like one thing that I think can really help to kind of flip the script in your mind, one thing that can make a difference? Can I do that? Okay. What do I do? I try and think of, I try and think of my fellow brothers and sisters. I try and think of my fellow church members. You ready? As saints. I know some of you are just like, he just said that, saints, right? But, but take a look around, all right? You, you know who you see? You see saints, okay? You see saints. Like, this isn't just some Jedi mind trick I'm trying to pull. Like, this is the application of gospel truth. Now, I know for some of you, like, this is hard because, like, you, you, there's like a little trigger thing that happens, right? And when you hear that word saint, especially if you came from a Roman Catholic background, you're kind of thinking of like somebody who like did a lot of good stuff and maybe even performed a miracle and then they got to kind of bypass purgatory and go like in the fast pass lane all the way into heaven, right? But that's not how the Bible talks about saints at all. In fact, the word saint literally means a holy person and it's the most commonly used word in the New Testament to describe Christians. Every individual believer in Jesus Christ. So the communion of saints, when we say that in the Apostles' Creed, we're simply saying like emphatically what it is to be a member of the holy Christian church. It's to be part of a communion of saints. That is all who believe in Jesus. And so here, here's what this means. If you believe in Jesus, you are our covered in, clothed with the perfect, beautiful righteousness of Jesus so that, so that in the sight of God, you're a saint, a holy person. Right? Now, that's not your own holiness. It's not your own goodness. It's, it's the, the perfection of Jesus clothing you, right? You've been cleansed. You've been washed. You've been clothed. You've been covered with the righteousness and the perfection and the beauty of Jesus. So whatever has been weighing down your conscience in life, Right? Whatever it sort of feels like it's still clinging to you, like the, like the humidity in Florida in the summer, like sticking to you that makes you feel dirty and yucky and, and shameful, like that's all been removed. You've been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Which means, friends, that you can now choose to see each other the way that God sees you. And when you do and you say, who's this person I'm a little frustrated with right now? You know what? That's, that's a saint of God over there. You know what happens? Well, so, so many tense situations de-escalate. I don't know what somebody thinks. Saint? You mean, first of all, like, you mean me? Him? Her? 
After, after what I did, after what she said, after what he did. But yeah, if you believe in Jesus with a humble and repentant heart, you are clothed with his beautiful perfection. So friends, you see each other as a saint of God and so many tense situations de-escalate. So much anger melts away. So much resentment goes away. So much hatred goes away. So much criticism goes away. So much compassion takes its place. So much understanding begins to happen. So much love begins to fill in all the fractured cracks in our relationships. And isolated people become connected. Friends, I hope today you can see the beauty of the invisible church. And when you do, that you can choose to see each other as belonging in this beautiful thing we call the communion of saints. Holy Christian church. Let's bring it home. Verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So finally... If not fully here, one day in heaven, we'll, we'll never hurt each other again. Never again will we disagree. Never again will we have to deal with decisions we don't like. Never again will we ever have to deal with this word we've learned, COVID. Never again will we have to deal with financial surprises or frustrated plans that fall apart. Never again will we struggle. Never again will we screw up. Never again will we grieve. Never again will people be martyred for their faith or face persecution or loss for the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we will be among those who will have come out from the great tribulation. And until that day comes, we are coming out. Those who have been claimed, our hearts claimed by the love of Jesus and our sins having been washed away. So yeah, now for a short time, we are, you might say, the church militant. I mean, like the embattled church the church under the cross, right? And like the struggle is real. But one day soon, we will be the church triumphant, the church in heaven, victorious with all the saints who've gone before us into glory. So in the Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics, right? 11,000 plus athletes competed from over 200 different countries. That's, that's incredible. But even more, more amazing, more impressive, friends, will be the sound, right, of that great multitude from every nation praising God for our salvation victory that Jesus won for every single one of us who by his grace are coming out of the great tribulation into glory. Friends, keep seeing the beauty. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all our human vision and understanding guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus until we see him face to face, triumphant in glory. Amen.